Hey, Raheem! It worked, man! Hey, your plan worked, kid! Raheem? Hey, do you copy? Shit. Hey, everyone. This is Scary, and I'd like to welcome you to my review of Dying Lights. I've spent quite a bit of time on this game, and I'm very excited to finally share my experiences with you. I've tried to keep this video as spoiler-free as possible, but just so you know, there are a few in this video review, so if you haven't finished the game yet, keep that in mind as you watch the video. Well, without further ado, let's get started. So this is the next installment in the series of games from Polish developer Techland, established in 1991, developer of games like Call of Juarez, Dead Island, and now Dying Light. As you can probably imagine, this isn't for the faint of heart or the weak of stomach, so if you're one of those two, you might want to take it easy with this game. So as you can see, this is obviously the PC version of Dying Light. Initially I was going to buy the PS4 version as I was new to the console and I really wanted to see what the console could do, but ultimately I decided on the PC version as I am, undoubtedly, a member of the PC Master Race. That being said though, it's not like this game is without its faults, and there were a number of them during the release. Anything from dropping frame rates to stuttering to screen tearing, well the list sort of goes on and on. Thankfully though Techland has taken the initiative to patch many of these problems and now the game does run significantly better. But this kind of thing is expected to happen, especially when you bring games from the consoles, such as the Xbox One and the PS4, and of course last generation, the PS3 and the Xbox 360, over to PC. If you guys remember Dark Souls, what a mess that was with keyboard and mouse. And probably one of the reasons why I didn't play it on PC, because it didn't really ever get properly fixed. Not to say it wasn't a great game, but it wasn't a great port. So moving right along. The graphics in this game, undoubtedly, are some of the most beautiful graphics I've seen. They're not too oversaturated, they're not too dull, and it really gives you that bleak outlook that you are in this zombie apocalypse and, well, you're really not going anywhere anytime soon. From the subtle lens flares during sunset and sunrise, to the volumetric fog effects and the rain effects that make your vision blurry as you progressively stand in the rain longer, there are a number of visual cues that really give off a positive vibe and a feeling of polish, so to speak. The moment you start to look past all the little technical hiccups that are present in the game engine is the moment that you really start to realize how grisly and brutal this game is. The combat in Dying Light is unlike many other games that I've played before. It isn't floaty and really gives you a sense of weight when you're swinging the many different kinds of melee weapons around. There are ranged weapons in the game as well, but each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages, and I'll get to ranged weapons a little bit later. When picking out a melee weapon in Dying Light, there are three stats you're going to be looking at. Power, durability, and perhaps most importantly, handling. Handling, as you've probably guessed by now, determines how well a weapon handles, how quickly it swings, and ultimately how much damage it does, although that is primarily determined by the power stat. What the power stat doesn't take into consideration, however, is how many times you'll be able to swing a weapon before getting tired. That's why considering both the power and the handling stats are an important way to judge how much damage you'll do. For example, if you kill a big guy and take his heavy rebar, you'll be able to swing it two or three times before you get tired. If you fail to connect on those two to three hits, there's going to be a period of time that you'll have to wait before you can swing it again, thereby limiting the amount of damage you can do in any given period of time. As with any game, things start to get better once you level up, and in Dying Light there are three different skill trees that you can progress through. If you've seen my first impressions video of Dying Light, or have played the game yourself, you're probably familiar with the three different skill trees. Survivor, Agility, and Power. As you've probably guessed, the perks in the Survivor tree help you to, well, survive. From being able to make boosters out of plants found in the environment to getting better prices at vendors, there are a variety of perks here that really make your days and nights a little bit easier. The agility tree will make you more athletic, allowing you to run longer, jump higher, and evade the zombies with greater ease. It'll also teach you a few special moves that you'll need to literally get the jump on your opponents, including a ground slam effect, and one of my favorites, the drop kick. The perks in the power tree are really quite self-explanatory. They'll help you do more damage, not use as much stamina when you swing your weapons, and also give you a few free repairs here and there. In addition, you'll learn a few cool moves that you'll be able to use with your melee weapons, including a whirlwind effect, 
and a few others that I don't want to spoil for you just yet. The great thing about these RPG-esque skill trees is that they level up automatically. Your survivor, agility, and power will increase accordingly to how you use them. If you're the kind of person that likes to run around and bludgeon things to death, you'll be raising your power significantly faster than the other two, as can be said for the agility tree with climbing, jumping, and running around, or the survivor tree by helping fellow survivors and completing missions. Between the story missions, side quests, capturing safe houses, looting for stuff, and exploring the map, there are a lot of things to do once you finish the main story. With that being said though, one of your focuses should definitely be to capture all of the safe houses as they're going to help your night gameplay significantly. Dying Light has a full day and night cycle, and if you're not careful and don't watch the clock, you can find yourself in a really compromising situation. When night gets closer and closer, you'll start to get warnings from your tower buddies that it's probably a good idea to go and hide somewhere in a safe house. Although, I've found myself to be ignoring those warnings most of the time because I've been so engrossed in the gameplay, either doing a quest or a run, looking for loot or just exploring. As with the weapons in Dying Light, there's a healthy variety of zombies to fight against as well. Most of the time, especially during the daytime, you'll be fighting against the more meat and potatoes type of zombies including the biters who would love to just bite your face off and the runners who still retain a little bit of humanity because they haven't fully turned yet, making them incredibly fast and agile. All bets are off though once the sun goes down. Even the somewhat harmless biters start to turn into something a little bit more sinister and you start to get chased by a variety of different zombies including volatiles who are incredibly fast and move, climb, run and jump almost as fast as you can. You gotta use all your cunning and strategy to get away from them and get yourself to a safe house immediately. I gotta say, the first time I ran away from a volatile, my heart was pounding out of my chest and it was probably one of the best feelings that a video game has given me in recent years. So why, you say, why would I go out and risk my life in the middle of the night just to get chased down by these incredibly scary zombies? Well, the answer is simple. Your agility and power points are doubled at night, and the longer you stay out, the higher the bonus becomes, making it effectively incredibly easy to level at night so long as you can stay alive. The one thing I don't think I've touched on yet is the crafting system, and I'd like to get into it a little bit with you now. So you're probably wondering what you're going to do with all that great loot you just gathered. Well, the great news is that most of that loot can be used as crafting materials for a variety of different items for use in the game. From things like Molotov cocktails, to weapons, to throwing stars, the list goes on and on. But the great thing about it is it's easy to use, it's simple, and it's satisfying. Unfortunately, the bare materials alone are not going to be enough to make your item. You'll need to learn how to use those materials to craft the item that you'd like, and for that you're going to need a blueprint. Blueprints can be acquired in a number of different ways, from investing in the perks in your skill trees, to doing story missions and side quests, as well as just exploring the map and finding different hidden areas with blueprints in them, or doing challenges. The choice is yours, and either way, it's really rewarding. If you'd like, you can also keep an eye on your favorite vendor, because from time to time vendors will carry blueprints as well. The chances are that if you buy a blueprint from a vendor, it's not going to be quite as good quality as one that you'll get for completing a main story mission, or maybe finding that secret hidden location on the map. However, it is a great way to get you started, and they're not very expensive. One of the last things I wanted to touch on is ranged weapons. Now, depending on the enemy you're fighting, ranged weapons can be great. That can be good for Rises men when you want to take them out at a distance, or those annoying toads that keep spitting stuff at you and you just don't want to get too close. The unfortunate part though is that weapons make a lot of noise, and zombies, especially these runners that you see here, tend to love noise quite a bit. Generally there will be about 3 or 4, or as many as 5, in some cases, running towards you at breakneck speeds after hearing you fire your gun. This can be very bad for you, especially if you're playing at night, and if you're not ready for a fight. You can be overwhelmed very, very quickly, and even at the later stages of the game when you have better weapons, you can die very easily. So be careful, and pick your fights. Dying Light is a great game. It's well made, and shows a good amount of attention to detail and polish. I think if you can look past all the small inconsistencies, which have largely been patched by the developer, you'll really enjoy your experience in Haran. 
With that being said, let me know what you thought about Dying Light, as well as this video review in the comments below. Feel free to hit that like button, and make sure to subscribe for all the latest stuff on the channel, as well as check out the blog at ssbgaming.blogspot.com. Thanks very much for watching guys, and we'll see you in the next video. Stay classy.